thank you. So today I want to be talking about uh, JSON app tokens, which are a web standard, like the standards that uh, James talked about, um, often used with um, OAuth and OpenID Connect and stuff like that. Um, but before I get started, who of you has ever heard of JSON web tokens? Keep your hands up. Who of you guys and girls know how they work exactly? I see some hands go down. I hope that by the end of this little session, you have the basic idea of what a JSON up token is and uh, how they work. So let's get started. Little disclaimer, I'm a bit jet lagged, so I might seem a bit uninterested. That's not true, I'm just a bit tired. Um, so let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Sam Bellen, I'm from Belgium, and I'm a developer evangelist at Auth0. If you've never heard of Auth0 before, we're an identity as a service uh, provider, which basically means that we try to make it as easy as possible for you to integrate a secure authentication flow so you can focus on building your actual products, which is the thing you love, right? Um, I'm also a Google developer expert. I organize a meetup in Belgium and one in London. Um, so should you ever be in Europe, please um, join our meetups. Um, and you can find me online as Atsambego. So I know we're all very serious people, but I have cat stickers. <laughs> so, if you'd like a cat sticker, tweet me a picture of your cat, your dog, your rabbit, your horse, any animal, that's fine, and I'll give you a sticker after this talk. Um, so I hope to see some tweets appear on my phone later. Um, so let's get started. Um, what I want to be talking about today are these three things. Traditional authentication, or at least what I consider, consider traditional authentication on the web. I'm going to talk about what a token is exactly, and we're going to see um, how to do a token-based authentication with single page applications in general. Um, but before I get started, who of you are front end developers? Just a few. We're at an API conference, so I didn't expect that many. Back end developers? Also a few. Architects and stuff like that. The rest of the room. Okay, so I'm going to try to talk to most of you. Um, it's going to be a bit divided, but let's get started. So traditional authentication on the web. Um, you have this, this scenario where you have a user which uh, goes to a browser, types in the URL of your uh, web page, your browser does a request to your web server, and it uh, sends back the page. But sometimes these pages are protected, so the user needs to log in, right? It needs to pass along some credentials, a username password um, most of the time. And if these match up, the server does the heavy lifting, it checks if the credentials match, and if they match, it sends you back the page. This is a really traditional um, approach. This is not for single page applications, this is pages generated on the server. Um, there's a bit of a difference, which we'll see in, uh, a bit later in this talk. So the most important part is that the pages are uh, rendered or generated on the server. All the heavy lifting, all the logic is handled by the server. Um, so we get our page back and the browser um, renders that. We don't only get the page back, but most of the time we get a session cookie back, a cookie which contains a session, which we can validate on the server so the user does not have to log in every time it visits uh, your website or every time it wants to, do a, to request a protected page. Does this seem familiar to most of you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so next time we, we, we access a protected page, we send the cookie. If the, if the session is still valid, we just send back the page. Right. So. Traditional web apps via single page applications. There's a few differences between them. Um, a traditional architecture is usually very tightly coupled between your web page and your server. You can have multiple servers, but most of the things happen on this one server, this one service, and it handles all the logic, and the web browser just displays the pages. A single page application can look a bit like this. You can have multiple APIs which you access from your single page application. Most of the logic is handled in the front end, some in the back end on these APIs. This can be multiple APIs, like a general API, an API for credential or user management, an API for payments, and any other thing you can think about. So we see a, a shift from logic to the front end, and back end, the back end, the APIs just handle most of the data and how to, do, how to deal with them. You can also have an architecture like this, a mobile app, a web app, a desktop app, and they all contain or use or consume the same data. Is anybody working on a project like this where you have multiple clients accessing the same APIs? Cool. Now the funny thing is, we've used a session cookie before for the web, um, the, the traditional web applications to provide that you have a valid session. But cookies are a way of, which is only, is, is a thing that's only, only used on the web. 
a mobile app does not use a cookie, a desktop app will not use a cookie. So it would be nice if there's a way to streamline the whole process and to have the same um, process um, of providing your credentials and uh, to um, show that you have a valid session for all clients that you're building. So what are some of the problems with a traditional cookie-based approach? Cookies don't like cores. Who likes cores? Usually there's one people in the room who's like, I do, and I know that it's lying, but this time, no. Nobody likes cores, um, because it's hard. Cookies require states, and in a ideal scenario, we would like our APIs to be stateless. It's not always possible, but cookies, especially session cookies, they contain a session which you have to keep in a database somewhere in your backend. You have to keep um, the fact if it's, if it's still uh, valid or not, if it expired, so it requires state. And cookies don't flow. You cannot pass a cookie issued by a certain origin to another server, another origin, because they are tightly coupled with the issuer, the origin that issued that cookie. So it's not really convenient in some cases. For example, when your main API wants to use some data from your credential, your, your account, your user API, it cannot pass this one a session cookie issued by your main API or the other one to another service. So that can be a problem when working with single-page applications, especially if, if you have multiple APIs. So what's the solution? Maybe it's token-based authentication. We'll see what that is later. But first, we'll have to talk about what a token is exactly. So a token, to me, is a unique identifier representing something. What this something is, that's up to you. It can be the fact that you're authenticated or not. It can be the fact that you have access to a certain resource or not. It's just something that you can take, and from this token, you can um, just get some meaning. It represents something to you, the person who's consuming that token. Um, there's different kind of tokens. There's an access token. Who's heard of an access token before? I think we all do. Most of us did. There's an ID token. Hands up again if, you know, if you've seen an ID token before. Refresh tokens, the same thing. Um, and they're often an opaque string in the form of a UUID, which means that they are a seemingly random uh, sequence of characters, a string, but there's not really any meaning to them, except the fact that you've stored them in a database somewhere, and based on this database and some extra properties in the database, you can get some meaning from them. But they don't have to be. It can also be XML. You can have a perfectly valid XML token, for example, if you're using the SAML protocol. And it can also be JSON web tokens, and that's what I want to be talking about today. A JSON web token, oh, at all zero, we use JSON web tokens as much as possible, just because we love them, they're convenient, um, and I'll try to tell you why. This is a JSON web token. Now, if you've seen a JSON web token before, it might look like a random string, a, a random sequence of characters, but it's actually made out of three different parts with a dot dividing the three different parts. Who's ever noticed this before? I didn't win the first time I saw a JSON Web Token. Um, but it's good to know that there's three different parts to a JSON Web Token. And the first one is the header. And the header is basically just a base64 of a JSON object which contains some metadata which algorithm is used to sign this JSON Web Token. So we're going to see later that you can sign JSON Web Tokens to verify its contents. Um, in, this in, in this instance, it's used uh, the algorithm HS256. And the fact that it's a JSON Web Token, so the type is a JSON Web Token. This is also metadata, which tells you a bit more about the token itself. The second part is called the payload, and this is usually the biggest part of your JSON Web Token. Again, this is some base64 of a JSON, web, a JSON object and this contains a bunch of claims. A claim is a key value pair which can be useful for the consumer of this token. For example, the subject, which is often a user ID, my given name, my family name, my preferred username, um, when it's issued at and when it will expire. So that's something that's interesting to note about JSON Web Tokens. They, contain, they can contain their own expiry date. So you don't have to keep a state of if a session is expired or not. They can contain this date themselves. And there's a bunch of different claims, and the first one are reserved claims. These are claims which are basically just um, defined in the spec of the JSON Web token, like the subject, the issuer, the issue date time, and the expiry date. The second one are public claims. These are not claims that are specified in the specification, but they are standardized. And there's a whole list um, of these um, by the IANA website. And they specify most common um, claims you can use, like my given name instead of my first name, it's given name, family name instead of last name, 
and, um, and things like that. Now, why do, do we have this second list? It's just for API, API interoperability. So most APIs use the same claim names or keys, so you can kind of know what to expect from an API when you're asking for a given name. And the third one are private claims, and these are basically just anything that is of use for you or the person who, or the, the service that needs to consume this token. As long as it's valid JSON, you can put it inside the payload. Don't put anything sensitive in this payload, though, because it's just a base64 of a JSON object, so everybody can go to base64.com or whatever, paste a part in it, and it will just show you the content. So don't put a credit card number in it, um, don't put anything s sensitive, just the bare essentials that you need to use this token. And the last part is the signature. So I've mentioned before that a token can be signed. This means that we can always verify if the content of the payload and the header has been tampered with. So how this usually works is you take a, a signing algorithm, you uh, take a base64 of your header, your payload, pass along a secret for this um, signing algorithm, and based on all of this data, it will give you a signature. Should your payload change, your signature will change. So it's not possible to change the payload without creating a new signature with this secret for this algorithm. Um, without this secret. Um, so JSON Web Tokens can be verified, and this is another strength. JSON Web Tokens contain their expiry date, or can contain them, and they can be verified, so you know that, they're, that what's in them is still valid, that it's not been tampered with. So some real-world examples of a JSON Web Token. An access token. An access token can look a bit like this, can contain the issuer who issued it, the subject, um, the audience, when, it's, uh, when it will expire, the scopes which you grant access to. Now, it's interesting to know that the auth spec does not specify that an access token needs to be something. As long as it's a token, it doesn't specify that it needs to be a JSON Web Token. It can also be a string. Um, but you can use a JSON Web Token. And in fact, one of my colleagues wrote a uh, recommendation about this, which has just been accepted by the IETF, I think, yesterday. So maybe in the future there will be a standard for using JSON Web Tokens as access tokens. Um, but for now, you can use whatever you want as an access token, including a JSON Web Token. There's also an ID token, which contains a bit more information about your identity. And this usually contains stuff like your nickname or your, your real name, um, a, your avatar. You will get this when you authenticate, so you don't need to do an extra request just to get the basic information about your identity. And you can show this right away. It also can contain your uh, expiry date again, and the issuer and subject and what have you. Um, so an ID token contains a bit more of personal information to use by the clients. The access token contains a bit more information about which access you grant um, to use by your server. Now we've seen the signature before, which, which used a secret, which is a symmetrical algorithm. There's also a bunch of asymmetrical algorithms, like the ones listed below. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce them because it's very hard. Um, but they don't use a secret, but they use a private key and a public key to sign and verify the JSON Web Tokens. And when you use a private and public key, you want to share your public key with the people or the, the, the services that need to verify your JSON Web Tokens. And this can be done with a JSON Web Key. And a JSON Web Key will, is just a JSON representation of all the data you need to verify a signature uh, of a public key. Looks a bit like this. Um, so which algorithm has been used, and then all the various information you need to um, validate a signature. So you can expose this JSON Web Key to the people who need to verify your signature, and they can just use it to verify the signature. Um, now, if you use the OpenID standards, there is this document which is exposed publicly, which is the OpenID configuration. I think I have it open right here. Can you see this in the back? And basically, this is just a JSON document which contains a lot of information about your, your configuration. And one of them is your JWKS URI. And if you click on it, basically, this is a list of all my public keys you can use to validate um, JSON Web Token signatures issued by my authorization server. So this is publicly. You can use this only to verify, because if you want to sign a new token, you need a private key. So this is JSON Web Key um, JSON I just showed you. So let's make a little comparison. This is the header of a JSON Web Token. This is a Belgian passport in four languages. I know you in Singapore are used to having multiple languages as well. Um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's confusing, but it's like this. 
And it's kind of the same thing. The passport says, I'm a passport issued by the Kingdom of Belgium, and I'm a passport. The header of a JSON Web Token kind of says, I'm a JSON Web Token, and I am signed with this algorithm. Now, if you open that passport, there's a bunch of personal information about you in that passport, right? Your name, your surname, nationality, but also when it expires and when it has been issued. The same thing can be for the payload of a JSON Web Token. It can contain a lot of claims you're interested in that are of use to you, and when it expires or when it's issued. Now, most passports also have some mechanism to prevent people of copying them so you can verify that they're still okay passwords that's enough that they've not been forged. So if you take those mechanisms like some UV holograms and what have you, and you compare them to the signature of a JSON Web Token, you have a nice comparison again, because the signature verifies that a JSON Web Token is still uh, okay, that has not been tampered with, the same as these mechanisms in a passport. So in essence, a JSON Web Token can be a passport. So let's see it in action. I have, let's see, a little demo app, which is very high tech, and it can show some pictures of dogs. Um, it has two buttons, it can show pictures of dogs, but it can also show pictures of cats. But as you know, dogs are friendly animals, they like to be petted, they like to play around. Cats are somehow a bit more mysterious and a bit more difficult, so they require authorization for them, for you to see the cats. So what do we do? We log in. Um, let's log in with Google just for convenience. So once, we're, once we've logged in, we got back an access token and an ID token, and I can use this ID token to immediately show my username and my avatar in the right-hand corner. But I also have this access token, which I can pass along to show pictures of cats. This is my cat, by the way. Um, so we're at API days. You don't really care about single-page applications. You care about APIs. Um, so I have this really, really simple API. You have three endpoints, one to get a new JSON Web Token, um, and as you see, I have this very secure username and password which I post to it. Um, and if I do that, I get a JSON Web Token. Um, let's copy this for later. Then I have my second uh, API endpoint, which is to request dog pictures. It's not protected at all because dogs are friendly animals. And then we have our cats one. And if we don't use any authorization for this endpoint, you might see that we get no authorization token was found because cats. Now we can take this JSON Web token we got earlier, this access token, and paste it as uh, a bearer token in the authorization um, header. And once you do that, you'll see that you get a, an image of a cat back. This is nothing new for most people who are working with APIs because we've been, we've been protecting our APIs with bearer tokens for a long, long time. The fact that instead of using a an UUAD, an opaque string, and we're using an, a JSON Web Token, does have some benefits. For example, should we take a JSON Web Token that has been expired, of which the expiry date inside of the payload has been in the past, and use this one, our API can immediately know that this token has expired, so it should not accept this access token anymore. The same goes for a token of which the payload has been tampered with, so the signature doesn't match the payload. If we would use a token like that, or API or API middleware immediately knows that this is an invalid signature, so it should not accept this JSON Web Token. So that without doing any extra lookups in the back end, just by inspecting this JSON Web Token, we have a certain, certain um, number of use cases in which we can already reject the access tokens passed along to the API without doing some extra um, lookups, which I think is one of the strengths of a JSON Web Token, right? So back to the presentation. If you want to know more about them, there's this little website called JWT.io. It's created by us as a disclaimer, um, but it contains a whole bunch of information about JSON Web Tokens. Um, it also has a debugger in which you can paste um, your JSON Web Tokens. We do not store them in the back end. We don't save them, so they're perfectly fine in there. Um, I say this as a disclaimer because some people think that we actually saved those JSON Web Tokens. We don't. And here you can build your JSON Web Tokens or debug them. And we have a whole list of libraries and a whole range of uh, languages which help you use JSON Web Tokens in your backend services. Um, so if you want to know more about it, jsonwebtoken.io. So are there any downsides to JSON Web Tokens? Every good thing has some downsides, right? There are a few. Invalidation of tokens is a bit harder. Let's say that I hire 
this fine sir here as an employee of my company and I give him access to my email, to my, um, all my systems. But during, during the first day, I decide that I don't really like him, so I want to fire him again. This is not personal. He still has some JSON web tokens maybe stored in his local storage or whatever of his browser, which are valid because the expiry date is still valid instead of this token, um, and some other things about this token are still valid. But I did technically fire him, so he should not have access to the systems anymore. So it's, it, it's not really easy to invalidate that token, well, because it's technically valid, but he's also not, um, he should not be able to use them anymore. If you want to invalidate tokens, you can use something like a blacklist or a whitelist. So you first check the tokens against, against this list and then go on to the actual validation of the tokens. And if you leak your secret or private public keys, you're kind of, sorry, fucked. Um, so keep them secure, but I think this is common knowledge that secrets and keys are supposed to be a secret, right? Um, and then don't put sensitive data in your JSON web token. As I mentioned before, it's just a base64 of JSON. Everybody can decode, they can decode base64 data. Um, so don't put anything sensitive, sensitive in there. So we've seen what a token is. Let's go to token-based authentication. Okay, so same scenario, user, browser, server, we do request. Sometimes the access we, the, the, the resource we want to access is protected. So we provide credentials, but instead of getting a cookie back, we get an access token back. And in the future, we um, just pass along this access token, and if it's still valid, we can access our, um, our protected resources and get the data back. The same thing as before, but instead of using a session cookie, we use these access tokens. Who have ever used auth before? Okay, most of you. Auth is a protocol that allows a user to grant limited access to their resources. That's what it's built for, just to grant limited access. You can let the user decide if it wants to give you access to your username or to a certain part of the application. Um, and that's it. And it's meant to use from one site to another website without having to expose your credentials, so you don't have to pass along your credentials from one side to the other. Um, you can just give permission through the auth protocol. Now this OpenID Connect, we've used it before. A few less people. Auth, OpenID Connect is basically you take auth and put an identity layer on top of auth and you have OpenID Connect. And it's defined as OpenID Connect was created as an identity layer for auth too. Um, because auth is only for a limited authorization OpenID Connect handles authentication as well. So in this scenario, I split my APIs from an account API and the rest of my APIs. My single page application um, goes to my account uh, API. I pass along, I type in my credentials, and if they're valid, I get back an access token. Same thing. But I can also get an ID token, and if you really want to, a refresh token, back from this authorization endpoint and store them somewhere in memory. Never save a token somewhere persistently in a browser when using single page web applications because they're very vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So you save them somewhere in memory, and when you need to access a protected resource, you use this um, access token, pass it along, and get your data back. So I mentioned before that you should never save these tokens somewhere persistently. Does this mean that a user has to log in every time you want to access something uh, something protected or when the user revisits your website. Since we don't save these tokens persistently, they will be gone the next time the user visits the website. There's some ways around this. So the login flow remains the same. We get our tokens back, but together with our tokens, the ones we requested, we get also a session cookie back. So we're back to the beginning. Um, so our authorization endpoint issues a session cookie, which will save in the browser. And then every subsequent visit it, at bootstrap of your single page application, you will send this um, session cookie in the background, usually in an iframe, to your authorization server. It will validate it and give you the tokens back so you can save them again in memory. So on bootstrap of your single page application, you're going to do this background request with this session cookie and ask for new tokens. This has a benefit that you can generate new tokens every time the um, user visits, which also means that you can invalidate all their tokens. And they don't have to be as, as long-lived as um, in some other use cases. And then again, you can use your access token to um, access protected resources. This is using the OAuth implicit flow. There's been a bit of a fuzz about it in the last few months. The IETF published a new best practices document saying you should try to avoid this if you're building new applications. 
it's not that there's new, some new vulnerabilities which have been discovered with this flow. Most of them has been known for a while and there's ways to um, mitigate them. But as a best practice document, they recommend to use the authorization code with proof key for code exchange, Pixie for short flow, which is a bit more complicated. Looks like this. Um, initially, you're just sending a code challenge to your authorization server. You handle your authorization, use an password on that authorization server, and it will send you back a code. Once you get this code back in your application, you take this code and send a code verifier, which is just a derivative of a private key, the same thing as the code challenge in the first step. And you send it back to your authorization, authorization server, and by combining or by verifying this verifier and the code you sent initially, it can verify that you are the client who initially requested the code, so it knows that it has been issued to you and you can, uh, you're the only client that can use this um, code. And so when you have this code and the code verifier and the code challenge all match up, you get your tokens back. This is a few more extra steps, but it makes it much more secure, makes this, it's the man in the middle attacks a bit less um, serious because the, to the code, if, you would be, if it would be intercepted, it cannot be used by any other party than the person who issued the code challenge in the first place. You get your tokens back and you can use them like you used them before. A quick note about refresh tokens and single page applications. Using refresh tokens in the front end should be avoided unless a system of refresh tokens, rotation, or sender constraints is in place. So unless you can rotate your refresh tokens on a regular basis, it should be okay to store them. Um, and sender constraints is just something we hope to have in the future, but does not really exist at the moment. Um, but if in the future we can do sender constraints, HSE and expiry date, a refresh token, sorry, can also be stored in the browser. So, to summarize, does this approach solve course? Who thinks it does? I think it does, because you can pass along a JSON up token to any server who knows how to verify them, and they can do whatever they need to do with this, with this token. A JSON up token is not linked to an origin, it's linked to a signature, basically a secret or a, p a private key. So as long as you can verify the JSON Web token, doesn't matter which origin you're on, you can um, validate it. Does this approach solve flow? Who thinks it does? I think it does because you can just pass it along to any server that needs it and as long as it can validate that token, it can use that token, right? Does this approach solve keeping state? Who thinks it does? few people, and in theory it does because it contains everything you need to know inside of that token, but if you want to keep a blacklist or a whitelist to invalidate tokens, or if you want to do the background um, um, request of getting your tokens, you are stuck with session cookies again, so you need to keep your sessions, um, so you need to keep state again. So in theory it does solve keeping state, but in practice it's not really possible yet because there's too many clever people trying to misuse the internet and hack stuff. Um, so, maybe in the future we'll find some way around this and uh, avoid keeping state. So let's summarize. Session cookies is hard with single page applications um, unless it's only your authorization server that needs this um, and you enable course and stuff like this. Stateless authentication is possible, asterisk, because of the things I mentioned before. And JSON Web Tokens consists out of three parts, your header, your payload, and your signature, so you can verify that the payload and the header has not been tampered with. If you want to know more, jsonwebtoken.io. There's also web authentication, which is the new API website we're, we're working on. There's a really interesting blog post about why to uh, this thing about the implicit flow and why you should use the Pixie flow, and our blog is full of interesting um, articles. I'll just wait a second so the cameras go down. And lastly, if you want to see these slides again, you can go to jwt.sambego.tech and they will be there. So, having said this, are there any questions? I'll just pass along this microphone. I think it's for the recording. I think it's on. Probably it's not a really relevant question because I guess the answer would take too long. <laughs> what about the other interfaces like voice, for example? For, and I, we found it really challenging at the moment where we have to retain the token when it comes to voice interfaces apart from the app and SPA. Mm -hmm. So what would be the best practice? I know that there is something in Alexa apparently in 
I mean, and Google Assistant, they also do all this kind of stuff. So what do people do in the industry globally? What are the best practices there? For voice authentication, yep. I'm actually not sure, so I will not say anything okay. in public, <laughs> but I would love to talk to you about this and see if we can come up with a solution. Yes. But I don't have anything that I I also can... don't have yet, but I mean, okay. it's just a discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions which I might be able to answer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, voice authentication is actually very complex. Uh, so currently, a lot of banks adopt this. Uh, you say something like, I'm a cat or something. So they will ask you to do this when you, you log into the bank, and then they will do that. So this is actually very dangerous. In, initially, it's perceived as very, uh, very safe. But there's a layer in your voice which they take out and they do the frequency recognition for that, not frequency, pattern recognition or voice print recognition for that layer. And then they authenticate you. But uh, you can fake this. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe it's worth mentioning that Wolf and OpenID Connect and JSON Web Tokens have nothing to do by the way you authenticate a user. So if you use a username password or you use social login or use voice um, authentication, that's all something else. It's just when this authentication has happened, you issue the tokens and you use those frameworks. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So I'm just explaining the case, right? Yeah. If you. If you want to retain the session longer, much longer than you would do it on your app, for example, because you don't want to uh, log in every time you say, hey, Alexa, I want to talk to this. I want to transfer money or what's my balance or whatever it is. So the question is how, we pro how to properly handle the session and retain the token or refresh the token. What's the best practice here? Still can't answer you. <laughs> yep. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, I know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I yeah, OK. <laughs> Okay. Um, you showed a scenario where there's a mobile app, a mobile web, and mm -hmm. desktop web. So in this case, does JSON or even uh, Auth0 capture any device-based information? Does it pass that through, or is it only? No. So the way that you integrate OpenID Connector Auth with different types of applications, desktop, um, mobile, web, all use a different flow. But the essence is the same. You get the access token and or ID token, and you can use them to pass along the access token to your API. Um, but Auth0 or the OpenID Connect protocol does not do anything like um, figuring out how, which device you're using, because you have to implement this protocol, this framework, into your app yourself. You should be able to, yeah, sure. Uh, the, the examples that you showed were largely about a service provider and then a web application or a mobile application and then the consumer in front of those. I just want to uh, check if there exists a prescribed pattern under OAuth, uh, which is for, let's say, two layers of, so for example, I as a service provider work with a distributor and then the distributor works with multiple uh, mobile application providers and then the consumers are in front of those. Is there a pattern, prescribed pattern that works for this? If it is, if you can give me some pointers that I can look up later. Yeah, we'll talk later because we'll have to make a uh, way for the next session, but there's a pattern for that, yeah. Yeah, there is a pattern. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can applause him, yeah. <laughs>